night. Hmm. What is consciousness doing here? It looks like we're getting supplied exactly what we need to go to the next step, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Okay, up here. 40,000 years ago, in the cultural cycle, was the development of art. Cave paintings, stone carvings, wood carvings, some of the petrified wood carvings they found. Art. There were tools way back here, but art. Art was very, very important because art was the consciousness of future. It was the first expression of future. You know, they didn't sit around the fire carving this effigy of a pregnant woman. You've seen that goddess, right? They didn't sit around carving that because somebody had become pregnant. They were doing it for, so that there would be pregnancies. They didn't, they didn't stand there and paint on the walls what they had just done with the bison. They were stating that as a prayer. It was magic. It was shamanism. They were predicting their future. Why did a caveman wear a bear claw on his, you know, or tiger's tooth or whatever? It wasn't so much a totem of what he had accomplished. It was so the next time he met a bear, he'd go, look what, uh, look at that. He was looking into the future to use that power in the future for his survival. And that's what art was all about. It wasn't decorative. It was shamanic for the future. Then, 32,000 years ago was the fifth night. And what happened 32,000 years ago? Neanderthal went extinct. Do you know why Neanderthal went extinct? Have you watched that National Geographic special or studied any of it? Well, the archaeologists finally figured out why they did go extinct. It was very simple. They never changed. For 100,000 years, they used the same tools, chasing the same bison, living in the same caves in the same valley. They never changed. They didn't travel. They wore the same style of clothing, when they were interacting with, uh, with homo, uh, with, when they started interacting with uh, homo erectus, then they started actually copying some of the jewelry and things. But they never took off because they never did art on, them, on their own. They couldn't imagine a future. So they didn't have one. They never changed, so they were off the bus. Take a clue. Okay, back here in the national cycle, this date right here is 40 AD. This line is 40 A.D. What was happening 40 A.D.? Who had just died? Julius. Jesus had just a little while before, yeah. But he was here and he had a certain message for everybody. And that message basically was, you're all divine. Every single one of you are the sons and daughters of God. And no one has any business getting in between you and him to do your speaking for you. No king, no priest, no governor, no one has any space between you and God. That was his basic message. And that message, remember this, these 
these is 397 years, almost 400 years. Here we go. We'll draw it like that. During this period of time, during this period of time, the message of Christ, not him, but his message was spreading out all over the world. That consciousness was being spread over that 400 years. And right here, this time period, the fifth night, was started at 416. Actually, it started at 413. In 416, Rome fell. The most powerful nation on earth. The empire of Rome. Fell. What the heck happened here? Did the swords go dull? Did the shields just fold up? What happened? Consciousness is what happened. The consciousness that Caesar was not a god. Nor any of the emperors. That each person had his own voice. And that Rome was, frankly, very far away. <laughs> so F you, Rome, you know? We're going alone is what happened. It was individual consciousness that brought that down. It was the recognition of this truth that destroyed that. It was the application of this information that undermined the authority of Rome. Can't happen again, though, could it? Not in our lifetimes. <clears throat> okay, the power, our planetary cycle. This line right here, the fifth day, is 1913. What happened right then? E equals mc squared. Einstein's work was being published and the general public and the scientific public were being apprised of this new understanding. Boy, there is the blueprint of our reality. That's a big opening for consciousness, huh? And then 1924, I mean right down the very center of that 20 years, 1924, Mr. Hubble discovered that we live in an infinite universe. Before that, you see, people thought that the Milky Way was all of creation. Mr. Hubble discovered that there are other galaxies and that they are accelerating away from us faster and faster and that we live in an infinite universe. In an infinite universe, absolutely everything is possible isn't it? Nothing impossible in infinity. Now there's an opening for consciousness. Wide open. Okay, what do you do with that when you go to apply it? Well, that line right there is 1932. And we went and applied all that acceleration and understanding in an exercise we call World War II. World War II, where we blew off the atomic bomb. And brought upon ourselves the weight of the responsibility that we could be the last. That's been a heavy weight. That's been part of your consciousness since you grew up. It's been a heavy weight. And I do want to point out something very important. As bad as all that waste and horror of World War II, 
It sure as hell wasn't 250 million years of meteor bombardment, was it? As a matter of fact, in World War II, 97% of all life did not go extinct, did it? You know, some people worried about <clears throat> when the bomb went off, that it would cause a nuclear winter. An ice age, global-wide, didn't happen. As much, <clears throat> as much as Hitler hated the Jewish people, they did not go extinct like the Neanderthal, did they? And when the Third Reich fell, there wasn't 30 years of war that raged across Europe. Like when Rome fell. In other words, folks, things are getting better. Dramatically better. Now, sure, our expectations have risen also. Like right now, animals have rights. Back here, you women didn't have any rights. You were animals. You were property. You understand? Things are getting better, dramatically better. And you should expect it to get even better. Go ahead. That little bit of dissatisfaction is worth it. So this all is accelerating, going up. And it's going by stages. And it's getting faster and faster and faster. Now remember two million years ago, we picked up this tool called the mind? Well, we're going to have a little bit of problem with that thing. <clears throat> and we all want to talk about that right now. The mind. The mind is a tool. And it's a tool that consciousness uses to distinguish similarities and differences between things. Okay? It is a tool, like a hammer or a saw. A carpenter doesn't think that he's his hammer. Well, not most of them. I know some guys that think they're their, their, their car, <laughs> but that's not true. Some people think that they are their mind. Get over that right away. You are not your mind or any of your thoughts. If you do hold to that, you're going to be in big trouble, and I'm going to show you. <clears throat> See, the mind... You don't, you don't hear about this in school either. You don't hear, especially don't hear about this kind of information. I took psychology classes and, and uh, no one in college ever talked to me about the flicker frequency. You ever heard of it? Flicker frequency? The reason you haven't heard of it is because this flicker frequency is very, very important in subliminal advertising which, of course, you would never have experienced yourself. <clears throat> the mind works on a series of pictures. Oh, well, special effects people know all about this. The flicker frequency. The flicker frequency is 24 frames per second. That's how fast your mind works. Your mind has a speed limit. Your mind can only think 24 thoughts in one second. It can only make this action 24 times per second. So the, the, like, it goes like a, like a flip card strip. If you, here's a ball, and the ball's coming, and it's coming, and it's coming, and it bounces here, boom, you know, and it looks like this. And then here it comes again, and it's going to bounce again. Right? <clears throat> That's how the mind actually works. Has anybody here been in an accident? Well, I don't want to bring up bad times, but something that was really dangerous. I mean, you could have died. And 
Did you see time slow down when you were in that accident? Yeah? Okay. Anybody see it go to stop motion? <laughs> that was serious. <laughs> what you just witnessed, and, and for those, maybe some of you kind of have that, and maybe not. Um, I'm telling you, and you guys, uh, I'll bet you will confirm it, these were peak experiences in your life. You still clearly remember exactly what happened, don't you? Oh, yeah. And the reason that was so powerful an experience is because it was a demonstration that you are not your mind. That your consciousness, your consciousness, is not limited to how fast this thing works. Very powerful information. This flicker frequency, 24 frames per second, is as fast as your mind can work. The mind is a tool supposed to do a job of seeing the similarities and differences so that you can make decisions concerning your survival. Now when the mind, which is a self-preservating uh, mechanism, when the mind understands that it can't do its job or it's not adequately able to make good decisions about your future, it's got a built-in, evolved-in safety override. A safety override system. And it goes in stages. The first stage of that safety override is called Stress. When your mind is t not sure of what's coming, it sends your body a signal. This is your walk away response. You're supposed to get up and walk away. Animals have this down really good. A dog will smell something weird and just get up and leave. Us, on the other hand, we have had parents and teachers and now employers who would not have us just get up and walk away, right? So we have adapted to stress. As a matter of fact, stress is a character evaluation on you. How much stress can you handle? That's right. Because if you could handle more stress, you'd go further up the corporate ladder. That's really what the, what the glass ceiling is on each person, is how much stress can you handle? I was just going to say that most disability companies um, no longer have uh, stress as a reason for being away from work. You cannot get that coverage anymore. That right. Was up two years ago. Meanwhile, doctors, doctors, the AMA proclaims that 80% of everything that goes wrong with your body begins with stress. Stress is such an epidemic proportion that all the benefits that used to be afforded to workers for stress have been cut off. Everybody's got stress. It's a pandemic. Now you guys kind of have a clue as to why. You know, if you make a telephone call, you're hooked up to computers that are making something like four to five billion decisions per second. Your mind is doing 24. Consciousness is moving at at least five billion decisions per second. Do you understand that consciousness is as fast as you can realize? So now we're talking about nanoseconds, which is one one thousandth of a second. I mean, a hundred thousandth of a second. Wow. Consciousness has just sped 
away from your mind. It used to be when, when, this, when this territory was, was settled, the people who settled it built everything in their house. From the foundation to the floor, to the windows, to the bunk bed, to the chairs, the tables, everything they built with their own hands, didn't they? Except maybe the pump and the skillet. Everything else, they built it. They had a certain amount of knowing about all of that. They knew about how to do it. Go ahead, go home and build a light bulb. That kind of thing is a source for stress. When your computer goes down, there's a whole lot that the mind doesn't know about. And it generates this stress. It's, like I said, it's a pandemic everywhere. Okay, so you're supposed to handle the stress. You're supposed to adapt to stress. And the stress builds. And we've just seen that this acceleration continues to accelerate, right? So what's next? If you don't handle the stress, then you go into this. The mind does this. It goes into the fight or flight. Now, here, all logic, this, this is suspended. <clears throat> there is no similarity or difference anymore. It's just a, a drop of adrenaline in your system, and the body is supposed to either run away or fight its way out to preserve your idea of survival. That's the mechanism. This, though, this fight or flight, this is desk rage. This is road rage. This is Columbine High School. This is terrorism. And all wars. That's what this is. And that is on the massive increase, isn't it? So what happens if you can't fight your way out, you can't run away? For instance, if you go and punch the boss in the nose, <laughs> or your teacher, then you're going to end up in jail or at least out of a job, right? So if you can't fight your way out, you can't run away, what's left? Yeah. This. Oh, I want bigger. There's one last ditch effort on the part of the mind to, to survive this. unconsciousness. If you can't run away or fight your way out, unconscious. What are you supposed to do if a bear attacks you? You're supposed to play dead. Maybe he'll only eat your arm. You, you've seen other animals use that technique, haven't you? Just, you know, they get caught and they just turn over on their back, put their belly up in the air and their legs, and they play dead. It's, it is a survival tactic. It just also happens to be the mother of all addictions and the father of all suicides. Basically, this is a denial of experience. And the southern bell don't faint dead away. Thump. What happened here? No one clubbed this woman in the head. She just decided to deny the experience. Didn't she? All addictions are a person's chosen method to remain unconscious. And it doesn't matter if it's alcohol, or if it's drugs, or if it's work, or gambling, or shopping, or sitcoms. All addictions are a chosen method to stay unconscious. And how many people do you know, yourself excluded, <laughs> that 
are stuck in that sort of thing. A whole bunch of people, huh? Are you starting to get the impact of what this acceleration means? 400 years ago, people had lots of time to sit and ponder things before they changed. In 400 years, you had lots of 24 of a second to work it out. But now, it's not that way, and it's going to get faster and faster on everybody you know, including yourself. This is a serious situation. This is why the world looks like it's going to pieces. Because it is. The mind was not built for speed. It was evolved when things were going a lot slower. You know, trying to keep your mind up to speed is sort of like taking your donkey for a run behind the family station wagon at 75 miles an hour. It's just not pretty. But that's what's happening to everyone. And it's going to get even more dramatic in the future. Okay? So, we're going to replace the tape. Did you all have a good break? Okay. That was a really good time to do it, too, in the talk, actually. Uh, I, I would venture to guess that this is a bit different than you expected. Then uh, we were going to talk about the Mayan calendar. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit, we're not talking about Indians in, uh, in the pyramids. You know, we're talking about what is going on in our lives today and what's going to happen tomorrow. And we're going to go into, from this point on, how to resolve the situation that we've discovered. Okay? And how you can take this out to your friends and neighbors and help them to resolve it too. Because you want to have some company, don't you? So we've got this situation, and I think you all, it's registering on you, isn't it? So uh, now, it's pretty evident that we are all going to be going completely out of our minds. <laughs> it's going to happen. So we might as well go ahead and look at what's out there, outside of your mind. What's out there? is your intuition. What is outside of your own mind is your intuition, your own personal knowing. Your own personal power. Intuition. This intuition, this own, your own knowing, without having to rely on any outside information or evidence whatsoever was made a death sentence by the Catholics during the Inquisition. They murdered over four million women for having intuition. Yes? Uh, just for the record, I'd like to say that there was a news story came over the media within, I think, about the last week where the Pope was asking for forgiveness what the Catholic Church had done during the Inquisition. Well, should we go ahead and forgive him? I think so. Where are the what? Oh, they're, they're gone. <laughs> those, those four million women, anybody, anybody who professed to know something without first producing the actual physical evidence on how they came to know it, was declared a witch. And they were burned and dragged and stabbed and they were persecuted. And as a result, 
intuition went out of style. We just put it on the shelf. But the Catholics knew what they were doing because this is your personal power. It's your own power. And you know the law of supply and demand. If everybody's got power, then what's mine worth? If nobody's got power and I've got it, mine's worth a whole lot more. And that's what they were doing to everybody. And that caught on and has been brought forward to the situation we're in right now. And thank you, Pope, for asking for forgiveness. It's about time. Actually, it's perfect time because we can now afford to forgive them because there's a larger understanding of what has been going on over all this period. <clears throat> there is no fault here. There is a process. No, Hitler, right here, was just doing his job. Bushies, the Bushies right now, Bush and Rumsfeld, Ashcroft, all those guys, they're doing a great job. They really are. Anybody want their job? Go, guys. They are tearing down everything that the power structure stands for in record time. <laughs> Go, guys! <laughs> we got to get this stuff out of the way. And they're doing a wonderful job of it. Intuition. Um, you know, we pay athletes a lot of money, don't we? To play silly games. Don't we? I mean, it's almost ludicrous, almost crazy how much we pay. Millions of dollars a year to go out and play a game? Are we nuts? Maybe not. Because, you see, these athletes, when they're out there, under very stressful conditions, I mean, playing for a national championship, with, with all kinds of money and your next year's uh, career on the line, plus endorsements and all that. And under tremendous stress, instead of going into the fight or flight syndrome, which would have them kicked off the court or off the team, instead of doing that, these guys routinely go into the zone. And they make the spectacular play. Under tremendous stress, with everything happening all at once, they just go step back, see and know everything about the moment. Have you read any of those interviews with the, the quarterbacks or the hockey players who see the play in slow motion? Have you heard about that? That's how they stay in the game. By being in the zone. Riding their intuition. There is no time to think about it. If you think about it, you've lost. When a quarterback starts thinking about the game, he's second string, third string, and out there making commercials. Being in the zone, being in their intuition, is why we pay them the money. Because they're doing something that we know is vitally important, something that we admire. We admire it. That's why we pay for it. Those clothes that you're wearing, 
I'll bet at some time or another, you bought them. And the reason that you paid anything for it is because you admired that apparel. And the more you admire something, the more it's worth to you, and the more you'll pay. And that's really the basis of all exchange. is how much it is admired. You can even admire how much you hate something. Or how much distaste you have for it. Or how ugly something is. You can admire how ugly something is, can't you? God, that's ugly. <clears throat> It's an amount of admiration. In fact, it's what beings exchange. Beings exchange admiration rather than money or thoughts or communication. They really exchange admiration between one another. You want to know where economy is moving to? It's moving away from money, isn't it? And it's moving into the exchange of admiration rather than physical goods. <clears throat> but this intuition, being in the zone, is very, very important. And since we're all going to be going out of our minds, oh, you'll still have one. No. It's sort of like you, you, you still have, uh, uh, we still have bodies, you know, we're using those as a vehicle, you know. You'll still have a mind, and you can still add two and two and that kind of thing. But when it comes down to dealing with changes and the amount of rapid change that's coming, this is the only thing that will work. You will not have time to think it through. You will only have time to take the action. And when you're thinking, when you're using the mind, what's also in there is all the fears, doubts, worry. Okay. Big clue. How do you know it's your intuition and not your mind? Your intuition is always, no matter what the circumstance, and that the, you guys that were in the accidents, remember? Uh, when you were engaged in your intuition, there was no fear. There was a calm certainty, a knowing of what to do. There was no time to worry about whether you were doing this right or wrong. It was direct action. Your intuition, no matter what or how dire the circumstances, your intuition will always be calm and knowing. Your mind, on the other hand, will throw in the kitchen sink. Um, I'm, I've talked to some people who um, shared experiences with these accidents and whatnot, they made it through the experience and other passengers in the car or, or companions didn't survive the situation. And these people knew exactly why they didn't survive, and the, the, the passengers didn't survive, and they did. It was because they personally stayed right there in the moment while the passenger was going, Aah! no, I'm denying this is happening at all. They were in their mind. The survivor was in their intuition. That's how important this is. Nine eleven is a big topic. 9-11, who survived, who didn't. The people who followed their intuition and went fishing that morning, instead of to work, survived. The people who got down out of the buildings when the first plane hit, and even including in the second tower, the people who got out of the buildings, followed their intuition, took a break, went home, they survived. The people who got out of the buildings 
then heard the all clear and their boss reminding them that they had customers on the West Coast that they should be selling stuff to, and then got back in the elevators and went back up into the buildings, didn't survive. What was the difference? The guys that went back up in the building had a reason. They had reason for going back in the building. I got to make my mortgage payment. You know, the kids got to go to summer school. They had reasons. I would get fired if I didn't go back. They had reasons, and they were in their mind rather than following their intuition. Just some examples. But this is going to become more and more critical as we go forward from here. More and more critical. Now, next problem. How do you find your intuition, and how do you keep it tuned in? Because, of course, we've all had the experience, right? We've all had the experience of our intuition. Usually, it's fleeting. It's a little thing, and then it goes away. And then it's clouded with all this doubt about, was that even my own thought, or you know, blah, blah, all that stuff, right? The mind just jumps right on you, and ha, ha, ha. <sighs> This mind thing is not your friend, friends. It's a parasitic, self-indulgent, self-preservation mechanism. It would rather be right than you be alive. The mind. You probably had friends who denied that there was anything wrong with them because the mind said, that can't happen, that can't be there. Nope, it's not right. It wouldn't go for treatment, let alone alternative treatment. And they're not here anymore. They were right until they actually kicked it. <clears throat> this is not a fairy tale. I mean, the mind would rather be right than mo in a lot of people than, than be alive. So getting a good grip on this thing is really important. And having this engaged really puts the mind in its place, where it becomes just a tool rather than an identity. So, how do you do that? Well, intuition is your own personal knowing. Right? And all knowing, all knowing comes from a source. We don't have to give it a name even. It just comes from somewhere. And it comes in a flow, more or less. It's like a this is, there we go, we'll have this flow of creation. See, the source of this flow would necessarily be the source of all knowing, because it's all that happens is coming out, all that exists is coming this way. So, here we have your consciousness in this flow of event, okay? Here we go, like this, this, this. Oh boy, it's getting quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. Your, your consciousness is oriented by time and place. In this flow. Have you noticed that when you have an intuitive moment, it seems like time doesn't go by at all? until way later, and you go, wow, where'd all the time go? <laughs> but for that time, you were just being there. In one moment, just like, it was a flow. Okay? This is... This is the, the schematic of how this works. When you're in your intuition, you're centered in that flow of information. The trick is to stay there. It's not so easy with everything that's going on and with your mind preying on you. 
But the Maya had two things on their side. One, things were going slower. But they had a couple of other orientations. We are oriented, our consciousness and our society is oriented by time and place. Time and place, time and place. Physical, 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 physical. The Maya had some more help. They had this orientation right here, which is called personal intent. One through 13. Have you ever been someplace you didn't really intend to be? Like at school or at work? Or the middle of an argument, you didn't, did you feel centered? Or did you feel uncentered? Did you feel centered or were you like off center? Okay, me too. When I was someplace I didn't really intend to be, I felt off center. But these guys, these guys knew their personal intent. They had that orientation. So it was easier for them to recognize when they were doing what they intended to do with this lifetime. That would help to keep you centered, wouldn't it? If you felt like, right away, if you felt like that wasn't happening, you'd get back on to what you were supposed to do. Okay? They also had this orientation this major orientation right here called the divine plan. In our civilization, there is no plan. It's been 16 billion years of happy little accidents that ended up with you sitting on that chair. That's the way our science looks at it. It might as well have been an explosion in a chemical factory that produced you here. There was no divine plan. These guys had a divine plan. They knew, and that there were 20 different aspects of creation. Like a dodecahedron, you know, the, the geometry figure, 20 sided figure. So, this personal intent and this orientation to the divine plan, that is the recognition of your part in the divine plan, that produces a symbol in the Mayan civilization. This, this, this diagram right here has a name. It's called the Eight Division Sky Place. And that symbol stands for heaven. You've been there. There are moments in your life when you were oriented by time and place. You knew you were doing what you desired or wanted to do. And you knew you were a part of something much larger than yourself. Felt cool, didn't it? Heavenly, ah. Huh? This is the importance of this calendar. The Mayan calendar was never about time, it was always about measuring and keeping track of the flow of creation and the intent of creation, and the aspect of creation every single day. Remember there's one law in the universe? What you pay attention to, you become conscious of. So what if every day you were paying attention to 
the energy of this flow of creation. What would you become conscious of? So, would it be easier to have your consciousness attuned to your intuition? Easier isn't all that good a word. It's automatic. Without any effort, without any thinking about it at all, and I mean no meditating, I mean no, con no, just forget it. You look in the morning, to see what the intent of creation is for that day. Then you go and you live your life. The Maya woke up every morning and celebrated the day for the purpose it served on to creation and then went and lived their lives. Every day. <clears throat> you know what the word entrainment is? Entrainment is the automatic syncopation of life forms or even mechanical objects. Uh, science doesn't have a real good explanation on why it happens, but they sure know what happens. Um, one example is a baby and a mother, and when they're nursing, uh, the mother and the baby's heart go into rhythm. They go into, they beat at the same time. That's called entrainment. It's a nat natural matching up. It works for objects too. If you take cuckoo clocks, in a clock shop, for instance, and you get them all ticking at different times, within a week or so, they'll all be ticking and talking at exactly the same time. It's called entrainment. And what this is, is a tool to entrain your consciousness to the flow of creation. 13 and 20. 13 and 20. And it goes 1 through 13, and it goes through these different aspects of creation, all 20 of them, and it starts again. So it's a weave of those two numbers. And you can go way into thinking about it, and it will do you no good whatsoever. It's only what you don't think about it, but end up just knowing from inside that does you any benefit. I know that sounds completely backwards from everything you were taught in school, but, well, we're not in school, are we? <laughs> Side note, I mean, part of this, part of this is that consciousness, we've been talking about consciousness as the awareness of being aware, and we've been talking about the mind as a tool that consciousness uses to see the similarities and differences between things, right? Consciousness, overall, it has a job to do. Consciousness divides creation. It divides it. Have you ever noticed that when you are really conscious, you can see the veins in the leaf or you can see the different colors on a butterfly's wings. Or you can count the stars. But when you're upset, and maybe not so conscious, everything looks kind of the same. Have you ever noticed that? The more conscious you are, the more divisions there are in your experience. And the less conscious you are, the more prejudiced you are. Have you noticed that? Where everything and all the experiences of all the people look the same. The job of consciousness is to notice the differences. That's how you count your blessings. That's how you appreciate the experience. It's by looking and picking out the differences. So consciousness divides. And the Mayan calendar says that it divides by 13.
all consciousness is divided by 13 in increments of 13 and 13 and 13 and 13. 13 is the number by which consciousness operates. No wonder 13 is unlucky and satanic. Hmm. Well, creation has a job too. Creation, I mean all of creation, multiplies. And all of creation multiplies by the factor of 20. 20 times. You, have you, anybody here studied uh, biology? I mean, the very beginning of biology, from the, from the single egg and on? Multiplies by 20. That's how you got so big. It's through multiplication of your own cells. And it does it in factors of 20. From top to bottom. Interesting, huh? So by following how this weave goes of 13 and 20, I mean basically that's what we're talking about, is that, that this rectangle. 13 by 20, just by, con by being aware of that, it entrains your consciousness to all of the interplay of consciousness and creation. And there's nothing that you can think about it that's going to help. It's just what you end up knowing. And your intuition kicks in, and you end up in the right place, meeting the right people, doing the right thing. That's what's going to get us all through this. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do that. I'm saying that this one works all the time. <laughs> and that's why this is important. <clears throat> there is something else that I want to do, and I want to do it for the camera. Uh, I want to do a, a formula because... Um, Everybody desires this one thing. And you look at the basis of all desires. I mean, this has got to be the one that's the strongest. Everybody wants peace of mind. Don't they? Peace of mind. Well, that's what, you know, peace of mind's got a lot to do with intuition, doesn't it? Because... When you have this, that's usually when this occurs. In fact, in order to have peace of mind, the only time you can possibly have peace of mind is when you are centered. Isn't that true? It's only when you are in this position that you can have peace of mind. Okay. <clears throat> How do you get centered? There's only really one time that you can be centered. That's when you're certain. When you are certain, then you're centered. Okay, where does certainty come from? There's only one source for certainty. The recognition of patterns. The recognition of patterns. Remember the first time that you were trying to learn how to drive? Did you have peace of mind? Were you centered? Were you certain? You didn't recognize the patterns yet, did you? Where does the key go? Which way do you turn it? 
Which is the gas? Which is the brake? Which is the clutch? Which way do I move this lever? What is this guy doing stopping right in front of me? All of those are patterns. Anybody taking dance lessons? Two-step, I did. Uh, square dance, tango. The more you recognize the pattern, the more certain you get, the more centered you are on the dance floor. To where you have peace of mind dancing in front of your friends. Hundreds of people. It's what you've been doing your whole lives. In every case. To learn something, you're going to recognize the pattern, to become certain, become centered, and have peace of mind about that subject. Now we have the pattern that we can prove, so you can be certain. Of course, it takes your own. I got mine. I would, for the last four years, studied in depth all of this stuff. I have my own certainty about this pattern, centering and peace of mind about it. But it's now available. A pattern of the last 16.4 billion years of everything that's happened. And the fact that the pattern shows things are getting better and better. No matter what it looked like at the time, we are evolving. And the situation is getting better and better and better that will go forward into our future, too. Because this ethics is scheduled to overcome power. Just like power overcame law. Have you recognized that? Law overcame reason, didn't it? Didn't it? You, we studied the law for quite a bit ourselves, just previous to coming here, so about 20 months. And there's very little reason or sanity in the way laws are written. Laws overcame reason. Then, actually, I should point this out, that during this period of time, during the fourth day, during the fourth day of this cycle right here, Law overcame reason. During the fourth section of this right here, which was from uh, 1874 to 1894, was the fourth day, that's when power overcame law. That's when Carnegie and Rockefeller and uh, Westinghouse all were becoming corporate powers that overcame the laws of nations and people. So we have ethics coming in now and during the fourth day, which is 2005, ethics will overcome power. We're just watching the, the throes of a dying animal right now. It's going to look bad, but there's lots of goodness past it. So, Peace of mind comes from being, when you're centered, centeredness comes from certainty, and certainty comes from the recognition of these patterns. So you can look out there and see what's going on and know with certainty that things are getting better. It's going to be very important. You're outnumbered. There are more people worried than certain. There's more people afraid of the future than looking forward to it. That you know. You're outnumbered. So it's very important that you have this as down as you can get it. At our web page, we have a web page, and there on the web page are articles and um, dates 
and, and places to look up data and match the dates so that you yourself can do the research. And don't rely on me or anybody else. It's your certainty you're looking for, not mine. Does that make sense? What? The website. Yeah. I'll just write it big on another piece because I wanted to do something else there. Okay. Here's the website. Of course, it's got the W's. I'm glad I had lots of room to write, you know? It's Mayan, that's M-A-Y-A-N, and then Magix is spelled M-A-J-I-X dot com. And <clears throat> you go to the learning, the learning lab, there's a little button that says learning lab. That's where you're going to find lots of the information and then uh, articles. We've got something like 1,500 articles there. Have fun. I know the winters are long here. Hey, there's a, there's a lot to read. I can give you what, uh, what I want to do, though, is I want to give you just a little bit of this data. I mean, please go research this for yourself. But I want to give you just a little smattering of it right here. <clears throat> this, of this pattern. So you, you can... So you know. Here is the, this is all of this is the national cycle. This is the first day, first night, second day, second night, all that, all the way down. During the during the first day of the national cycle, let me show you where that was. That was from 3115 BC forward, okay? That's <clears throat> this is the national cycle. Here we are in this one. That one is 3115 BC then the power cycle, and then ethics, or then galactic cycle. <clears throat> what happened in the very first day of that is this was the first idea of one god. Remember, there used to be lots of gods. I mean, all the reasons, you know, there was a rock god, there was a tree god, there was a sky god, there was a... Oh. Well, <clears throat> right here was the first idea that there was just one god uh, in charge of everything, or created everything. <clears throat> during that, during the first night, which is the application of that, Abraham moved to Canaan. And started up a church for that one God. That was the application of that. Then, down here, I'm going to skip a little bit. <clears throat> down here, the third day. The third day is always, always. When the truth comes forward, I mean, comes busting forward during, during the third day. That third day of that cycle was when Moses received the Ten Commandments. Hmm. Has that got anything to do with law? Boy, it was laying it down. During that third day, boom, the law was laid down, and that's what the national cycle was all about. Then, during the third night, Islam was, in, was created during this third night. And Pythagoras was developing his theories of geometry during this third night. Okay? During the fourth day, <clears throat> right here, during the fourth day, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Lao, Lao Tzu, which was a, a, a very important Chinese philosopher, Buddha, and the idea of reincarnation <clears throat> in India. That's what happened during the fourth day. Right in the middle of this cycle. What we have here is down here in the fifth day, of course, there was Jesus. 
Okay, down here was more about the second thing of Islam. Here, in the sixth day, was the Crusades and the Catholic Church was developed. Down here, and then we went into the second wave of Islam, which was the coming back after the Crusades, their, their backwash. And then we had the pilgrims down here. And the development, more development of Christianity up to where we are now. Over here, in the planetary cycle, during this, this course, 1755, and what we had here was the beginning of the first idea of a telegraph. It didn't even exist yet. It was just written about. Then, during 1794, we had the optical telegraph, right here. Then, in 18, oops, 1834, we had the electrical telegraph developed. During the fourth day, down here, we had the telephone invented. And Tesla. You know who Tesla is? With electricity? I was working with Westinghouse and then split off from them and developed what would be free energy during the fourth day. Then we have down here, we have in the fifth day, the radio was invented, and of course E equals MC squared. Then here, in the sixth day, the television was invented. And then down here, in the seventh day, the internet. Okay? Now, let's go over here and look at the galactic. This is planetary. Here we are at the galactic. What are we going to see here? Well, in 1999, we saw Y2K, right? Then, during this first night, which was the very end of 99 into 2000, what we saw was the, uh, the WFO riots, World Federation Organization, World, the consolidation of power was, was rebelled against during that period of time. There was, uh, during the year of 2000, we had the display of polarity, that is, people in the streets backing, uh, backing away from the power organization. That's in the second night, 2001, we had 9-11. Pretty strong demonstration of the have and have nots. During the third day, which started in 2002, we had, oh, also right here, we had the financial collapse, the, the, the uh, tech bubble burst right there. 2002, we had Enron. 2003, we had the rest of them. <laughs> Plus, we have the, the scandal, let's just call it scandals, coming to light. In other words, during this third day, the truth started to flow out. The things weren't right. During the third night, it has been applied, hasn't it? People are going to jail. People who were caught then are going to jail now. What people were finding out about the economy and how rickety it is, now, during this third night, the economy is failing. The money supplies, well, there's over money supply, which means that your dollar is worth less and worthless and worthless and worthless. And all that is coming forward right now. Right now. Preparing to sweep the field clear for the fourth day. Remember, the fourth day here, all this philosophy was developed here. Here, we got the ability to communicate freely and Tesla with his work in energy. What we're looking at right here 
is the exposure of free energy for everyone. This, during the, during the fourth night, is when it will become applied worldwide. What is the discrepancy between the rich and the poor? How much power they have available. How much energy they have at their disposal, that is the only thing. Without enough energy available to everyone, you can manufacture lack of anything. You can manufacture a lack of water, of food, of transportation, easily, just by regulating the amount of energy they have. Here, that ends. In the fourth day, which is, it starts <clears throat> July, uh, November 28, 2005. Almost the end of 2005, November, is when that starts. And runs through 2006. Here we have 2007, I'll just write it that way. 2007 is the fifth day. Now here we had Jesus, here we had e equals mc squared, here, what do you suppose is going to happen? Don't you suppose maybe a blend of the two? The fact that you are divine and that everything is possible. I mean, here is where we're liable to meet the neighbors. Extra terrestrials. Right there. 2007. We can't meet them face to face right now because we don't have an ethical consciousness, do we? We have a power consciousness. We shouldn't be out there. Can you see us out there in the galaxy right now? Earth number one will kick your ass. You know, that's how we'd go at it. We'd be attacking everybody. We're under quarantine until we get over this power trip. Then we'll be able to meet the neighbors. And during this time, right here, in 2000, by 2008, there will be the end of manufactured lack. Absolutely, there won't be any lack of anything. Because up here, during this period of time, we will have teleportation. You think we're kidding? I have an article right here about, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a little article right here about spooky science. You guys read that in the paper? It was in your guys' paper. <laughs> spooky science offers promising step toward ultra-fast computers, but what they're talking about here is the ability to, to record the molecular data of an object or thing, or you, and then send that data instantly to another place and have it remanufactured at the other end. Beam me up, exactly, and they're moving right toward it. It's constant acceleration. So by this time, by 2007, we'll have teleportation, at least for objects. Of course, that'll put everybody out of a job. Yeah, I mean, everybody, most of you guys have something to do with the delivery of goods or services. It's instant delivery. And if you can take a recording and send it once, why not be able to send it a thousand times to different places all at the same time? So where's the fall of the uh, financial world? Right now. Now. This, third night. Right here. The question is, when is the falling of the financial world? Right now. The dollar and the Canadian dollar, the loony and the toonies are absolutely worthless. They're worth nothing. They're not worth any, they're taking up space in your pocket. So what's going to replace it in the, in the new world then? Only admiration. Yeah. Then, I'm going to go on just a little bit. 2009, 
will be a time of getting used to bliss. It's going to take some practice. We've been so involved in everything going wrong that we're going to have to get used to being able to create things going right. It's going to be like learning to walk or live all over again. And this all leads toward what we were talking about right here, October 28, 2011. October 28, 2011, the end of the Mayan calendar, when we are consciously co-creating our experience. Time travel is all in here too. So if you can travel any time you want, what good's the calendar? You know, it all goes, the, the whole idea of time and space goes extinct as orientation. That's what's in our future. We do have this little bit, the little bit of a hump to get over here with the governments and the, you know, the economy. Yes? Um, if time travel becomes normal, mm -hmm. does, are you saying that we could have it in our past as well? I'm not sure. Would I, that be a... I know that it's coming. I know that we have already time traveled electrons in the laboratory. So there would be, you could meet people that have now died? You go possible. Very, everything is becoming more and more possible. Yeah. It's bit pretty hard to <laughs> conceive, is it? Isn't it? It really is. It's sort of like uh, being four years old, and your mom is like pulling stuff off the top shelf. You know, sh stuff is up there, <laughs> but but you don't know what it is. It's just not at that stage yet, and that's how we all are right now. Oh, up here. Oh, um. The, say something oh, in a little response to her, but I mean, if you know a little bit about shamanism, they're time travelers. The shamans? Yeah. Oh, like yeah. The universal experiences, they will see prehistoric beasts or whatever, and it's universal no matter what culture they came from. Yes, it That's is. That's a time traveler. Yeah, indigenous, indigenous people already had bits and pieces and parts of this all along. We've lost it, and now we're gaining it back. Sometimes you don't know what you got until it's gone, you know? Native cultures are persecuted as much. Yeah, it won't be this time. It'll be wide open, accepted, and understood, yeah. Yes? Yeah, I was just, uh, you mentioned the, the source or the, where creation is coming from and our consciousness. I just wanted you to comment on something I read about, uh, this was, this Mayan calendar was kind of written off by our science, right, basically? Well, it's point. being confirmed by no, our science. But yeah. early on, they really pay attention to it, like uh, for Oh, yeah. So, right. but I've books like the Edgar Cayce books, and that, that it came from outer space. Other people, not scientists, were trying to say that the Mayan people could not have had this, and that they got it from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Why, why couldn't people have it? You know, but what do you, could you comment on that? And now you're saying that we're, we're just about to meet the neighbors, Somebody else was saying that they've already met the neighbors and got all this from them, right? Right. At least a couple of neighbors. Not all the neighbors. You know, like individuals. Well, uh, like extraterrestrials are here right now. Power hungry, sneaky, secretive, unethical alien beings. Not everybody out there with high tech is all goodness and light, you know. So we're already in, in some sort of contact with extraterrestrials, but they're not the ethical ones. What I'm talking about here is we'll be in face-to-face -face contact, good, clean communication with our neighbors, exchanging data and technology and all that on an ethical basis. Yes, any other questions? Oh, I'm, yeah, uh, up here at the front again. Um, with these type of, with this hybrid calendar, um, I watch several documentaries on uh, prophecies from all different nations since the beginning of times till now. So where does that, how do all the chaotic things fit in, say, Nostradamus is for example saying we are disembarking on maybe a 27 year period of absolute 
um, war and miserable things. Well, we're, we're embarking on an absolute destruction of everything that you rely on. Okay, so that's all included. In yeah. Everything that you rely on, delivery of electricity, of food, of water, and stuff like that, will all be threatened in the very, very near future. So this isn't going to blissfully transfer? Oh, no. It's like, Bush is not going to go, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I, I, I screwed up. I'm out of here. No. He and all of his people are not going to walk away. Yeah, it's going to be rough. But it's going to be short. Very important to understand. It's going to be quick, vicious, and over with. Six months. Six months. Six to nine months most. And then we'll be putting the pieces back together. But we do necessarily have to go through that. And every time, every third night, there is like a boom. Revolution, well, here. This one, 1854. What was happening at, in America, 1854, right, 1861, was the Civil War. And during this whole period, the Civil Wars all over the world, in Russia, in India, in Spain, France, there were Civil Wars everywhere. We're just going through the same cycle again. The world didn't end then. It's not going to end now. It's just going to be rough. Yeah. About the uh, changes that you're talking about, in your uh, Okanagan tapes, uh -huh. you had mentioned that uh, shortly after this December, there's the issue of the uh, slowing of the rotation of the Earth. Oh uh, yeah, that was Greg Braden. That's was from talking Braden's about. material. That was, is, that's from Gre Greg Braden's material. Yeah, Greg Braden mm -hmm. was. I was referencing to Greg Braden's material where he was saying that we we're going to be doing a, coming to zero point. Right. Zero magnetics and a slowing of the Earth, and then a reversing. Of oh, I would, I would like to hear your comments on uh, what type of reality you envision after the Earth has stopped and started the other way, uh, in light of the comments about uh, all these new technologies supposedly coming in. And I don't have anything concrete to say about it. I have my own personal thoughts about it that it will reverse the polarity on the power. You know, to where people won't be so self-centered, but they will be open to more uh, inc inclusion. But my question still comes to the point that if this scenario does take place, then uh, realistically one could assume that we're looking at something like, what, two or three percent of the world's population surviving? You start spending things... More than likely it'll be about a... Th <clears throat> it'll either be two-thirds or, or one-third, because that's the natural proportions of everything, is one-third to two-thirds. So it depends on how well people understand what we're coming up on and going through. So this is the ascension process, basically. Well, it's... it's <clears throat> when we talk about ascension, mm -hmm. uh, that's the intuitive mind, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. The, the promise of ascension is that this time we're taking our bodies with us versus leaving them behind. Mm -hmm. Our consciousness will teleport us, mm -hmm. in other words. Oh, yeah. When the time is right. Actually, right now it's happening. It's yeah. a process. Right. It's like a tree grows up and then bears fruit, but it's been growing the whole time. Mm -hmm. You see, we're, we're growing mm -hmm. very rapidly right now. Do you think it's a possibility that those that aren't ready would be teleported to another place, or is Earth going to stay Earth? It's very possible that aliens not so ethical will very soon show up in the skies and start teleporting people, you know, beaming them up and sending, shipping them wherever. I mean, it's much more as possible now than ever before. Like all kinds of goodness and badness all at the same time. All the science fiction shows that you've ever seen of moan, there, those possibilities are more there because more is happening in less time. What exactly is going to happen, nobody exactly knows. Other than, we're going to call an end to this talk. <laughs> that is predicted. <clears throat> I'm getting hungry and I bet you guys are too.